What time is it? It's 9 p.m. What do you mean? What do you mean? That can't be right. The sky is blue. It's fine. It's Sweden. That's not fine. Why is it like that? It's okay, Mark. It's the midnight sun. That feels wrong. I don't like that. I promise you it's okay. I'm not okay. Oh, fuck. It's a new person. What? I don't want new people right now. No, new people are good, Mark. Hi, hi. I'm just gonna lay down, okay? Yeah, do that. Everybody else lay down. Somar episode of Frostburg Film Society podcast. Uh, this is really interesting. Perspectives on it. Well, before we start, Midsommar is a. This is a uh, 2019 horror film released in the summer. It did really, really well. I mean, for a 148 minute runtime, it uh, it it had a nine million dollar budget. Ended up grossing $48 million, which is huge. And a little bit of backstory. This was kind of originally envisioned uh, by the folks in Sweden as uh, just a straightforward uh, slasher film involving cultists and so forth. And a lot of the cult elements and so forth kind of remained intact. Uh, But when the writer-director... Ari Aster was first pitched this. He turned it down because it sounded a little straightforward and flat, and he's a little more... Well, he, he just makes different kind of films, if you've seen The Vich or Hereditary. Uh, you know that he... His specific brand of horror is very unique unto himself, and he does tend to do a lot of cult... Uh, inspired things, a lot of things involving witchcraft, of course, and and, um, dark elements and nefarious behaviors. With this film, the idea was that they were going to co-produce this between the United States and Sweden, and Ari kind of looked at it and went, eh, but he did his own thing and made this much more about uh, trauma and the deterioration and loss uh, of relationships. Um, So much so that the opening sequence featuring our protagonist and really all of the people that we come to know over the course of the almost two and a half hour film, uh, you know, we find that her sister murdered her parents and then committed suicide via uh, carbon dioxide poison poisoning and... It opens with her getting this weird email and sort of leaning on her boyfriend for some kind of emotional support. And, you know, she's freaked out. Um, And then you cut to the other side of her boyfriend talking with his friends about wanting to leave her. And them sort of encouraging him rushing towards the exit and the relationship. They're planning on taking this uh, summer trip that's going to last a month to this, uh, I guess is a Swedish village. One of their um, friends is doing a paper on Midsommar traditions uh, in Europe. And sort of her boyfriend later on piggies, piggybacks off of his own friend's idea. Once her, you know, her family is sort of discovered dead, it's almost like her boyfriend is pinned in this situation where he can't leave her. He kind of feels trapped. And, well, what kind of, you know, dick would leave somebody when they've lost everything? 
and it's uh, very hard. So she finds out two weeks before they leave that they're leaving. And so to kind of smooth over the situation, he uh, invites her to tag along, which she does. And his friends are not very happy about it. They wanted to go do... Well, a couple of them were having sex tourism type conversations. And their one friend is a... He's a uh, student from abroad that has come to this American university to study on his, his... I don't know if they were specific about whether he's doing a master's or a PhD. A lot of them are working on their PhDs. But he's inviting them to tag along upon arriving it's like as soon as they get there before they're walking deeper into camp they decide to uh take psychedelic mushrooms and <laughs> sort of the freak out is really funny that they experience in real life i'm sure a sober mind removed from the situation would still find it very funny uh, but in that state is terrifying which explains why they're freaking out so much but they get into his village and it's you know they're these really warm beautiful colors and everybody's wearing white preparing for the uh midsummer celebrations they have planned this is in this particular one that they're arriving to is a particularly special one I think they said something like it. They only uh, celebrate it every 90 years or whatever. The beginning of these festivities are are a lot of fun, semi-wholesome things. It was dancing, and, and I believe they started taking the drug tea early and and so forth. But, you know, everything turns grim. It... it it does a complete 180 out of, you know, the, they mentioned that at 74, you, you're dead, you're done. You know, it's like 50, whatever, to 74, you're mentoring. When you hit 74, it's time to die, which is kind of harsh. And then they witness uh, two elderly people from within the community jump off a tall ledge to their deaths. Well, the lady dies quickly, the man... <laughs> Uh, breaks his leg in the most horrific way imaginable, and in which case, several members of the of the community with this large hammer kind of smash his skull in until it's flat. It's very brutal stuff. The friend of theirs that is originally from this community that has invited and brought them in, he sort of about halfway through so the film, it seems, especially after the elderly folks uh, die, that his feelings towards our protagonist um, are made very, very clear. There have been several debates because everybody is referring to these. For the most part, it's A24. There are several other companies that have um, released these things recently, but, you know, I've heard uh, art house horror. I've heard elevated horror. I've heard high horror. <laughs> But basically, it it feels to me as though this is the same debate from... It was like when something really great comes out of the horror genre, Silence of the Lambs. They were saying, it's not a horror film, it's a thriller. Well, bullshit. Like, <laughs> a hor horror is horror is horror. That's like saying, the jackass movies aren't comedy, they're gross-out documentaries. And it's like... No, <laughs> the comedy gross out is part of it, but there's a lot more going on there as well. And just like this, like, you know, when people that, that don't like the horror genre have this thin veneer idea of what horror is. And a lot of it has to do with slashers and brutality. And that stuff most certainly is a part of the genre, for sure. But it is a very wide genre, and some of the most interesting ones are not supernatural or gory or cruel or nihilistic. 
there's a lot more thought going into them. Um, I adore um, the others. Is that Nicole Kidman ghost film? There's very little of any of that, but it, it's an absolute brilliant horror piece. And you look at again something like Midsommar or Silence of the Lambs that there is no supernatural element. Or you look at uh, Babadook. And these are very powerful, bright works of art, I think. And I love the genre. And it just kind of bums me out to hear people kind of sidestep what these things really are. Which, I get it. Like People want to minimize the intrigue of horror. But uh, it's a real shame, because horror, I think in a lot of ways, has the most to say. It's the best metaphor when you look at uh, George Romero's zombie films. From Night of the Living Dead to Dawn of the Dead to Land of the Dead <laughs> and so on and so forth up until Diary of the Dead. The interest and the reason I think he probably didn't make more zombie films is that uh, to him... What he was doing, the zombies are sort of a backdrop, but there's a larger discussion being had within the film about society as a whole, and it these metaphors are fantastic for that. And these monsters that we think of that are iconic in classic horror, vampires, for example, are iconic classic horror, back to their origins, but... Then you look at something like Twilight, that they're almost completely removed from horror, right? Anne Rice, her, her vampires had some horror elements to them, but that was taking a backseat to the more uh, sexual elements of that stuff, which I think is very much what they did with things like True Blood and... Uh, Twilight is a great example of um, sexuality and teenage angst takes a front seat to uh, true horror. Another step forward from that, look at The Shape of Water uh, by Del Toro. And I'm sorry, that, that creature is, what do they call him, the Frogman, I think, from Creature from the Black Lagoon, which is... Creature from Black Lagoon is my favorite early universal monsters horror films. I, I love that film. And he sort of re-envisioned the world around that monster. And instead of focusing on horror and violence, he focused on something kind of more interesting and beautiful and made it a love story, which is interesting and bizarre in its own way. But now that I've set my piece back to Midsommar, and it really would just go to the end because the slasher parts and the mysterious deaths and disappearances and things are still some of the kernels of the original conception are still within the film. It was just sort of recontextualized and written through Ari Aster's sort of vision of what this genre is and what it can be. And, you know, when you look at it, this sort of opened up the great debate at the screening, um, which is, again, a thing that I love about film society so much is that these discussions sort of allow us to see something we've seen maybe multiple in my case mul I've seen this film multiple times and to me what I thought it was about was about a young lady that finds a new family that she has to destroy the old parts to move forward and part of that was sacrificing her boyfriend you know because there's this really interesting sequence in the back uh, the, it was the third act and at first, it's him, after our protagonist 
wins uh, the queen title for outdancing everyone. <laughs> um, her boyfriend is sort of led into this building, and he has sex with his friend's sister, right? The the guy that was attending um, graduate school or whatever with them that invited them there, his little sister, they said, she's up for breeding, she's an adult now or whatever. And he initiates in this thing where the older women are sort of uh, standing around them in a half circle, like watching down, and it's it feels as though they are experiencing this with and sort of guiding her into what this experience is supposed to be. So, you know, they're moaning with them, and at one point, one of them start pushing behind him into his thrust to sort of get things going further and sort of lending sort of voices and patterns for her to breathe and moan and so forth. Um, and then our protagonist, the girl, she witnesses this going on through basically peeking through a keyhole and runs off and goes into mourning and the girl the the young women that she was with sort of encircle her and as she's screaming and and crying and wailing they are joining in on those same sounds some people thought at first they were kind of taunting her but you look at the pain and pleasure aspects and you kind of see what this is is a community sh uh, it's a community sharing experiences and so that's what i thought this was about to me and it in a lot of ways it i think that is part of it maybe is that this is about share experience her finding a new family, a new community, a place where she feels wanted and respected and loved. Whereas with her boyfriend, it she, it felt like she was chasing him or trying to keep him with her instead of him wanting to be there. But something was pointed out, which the smile at the end that she gives, I thought was from the relief of her finding these things uh, but uh, good for somebody at the screening pointed out that he thought it was about revenge that her boyfriend treated her terribly through this entire thing and she's smiling at the revenge that she's gotten as he dies horribly and that may be part of it that Again, there's a lot of duality in this, where they're showing you these beautiful images, and the cinematography and the color choices and images are gorgeous. It really is visually one of the most interesting and beautiful films you could ever see. There's not a starkness that you come to expect with Ari Aster films. Uh, it's very bright and very warm and very colorful. But, you know, it's also kind of used as an interesting juxtaposition to the violence and the more horrific elements. And again, that's the other, is these type of films they're being discussed like they're brand new, and I could not disagree with that more, because a lot of times when you're watching them, it's two, three images, sometimes just one image, but generally two or three images throughout the film and not placed in your expected areas within the format of screenplays or film that you would think to find them which I believe makes them that much more powerful, and the films are driven by these images. And while I do think in most American horror films this is kind of a new thing to a lot of people, 
especially people that have not dug into the horror genre. Uh, but for me, it feels very European. I've seen this type of stuff done before. You know, when you're talking about a lot of times, Jalo films um, work this way. A lot of times, well, with Dario Argento really pushed those ideas very much forward. I mean, even while somebody like uh, Lucy Falsi, when you look at like Zombie or something, tons of gore, tons of violence, plenty of nudity, but when I think about the film Zombie, what I think about is there is a close-up of a zombie rising out of the grave that they put on the box art and posters for this film, and they've been utilizing that for a long time, and the reason is because it is such a powerful image. Uh, but these things are full of those uh, images. You know, again, every film generally gets two or three that are moving this way, and even the... Um, what they're calling the French extremists... You know, things like martyrs, uh, high tension, I believe is one of them. These films are very much that way as well, where they are again are picking two or three images and driving the entire story that way. When you look at Suspiria, uh, even the remake, oddly enough, the remake is this way as well, where it really does come down to a handful of images. And I think that's interesting. I think the dichotomy of these things and the choice of imagery and uh, what really makes this spectacular is how grounded it is while simultaneously being extreme and horrific. And the beauty of it only adds to the power of the gruesome, horrific elements that you're looking at. Um, and it's another thing <laughs> that I absolutely love about the horror genre is that yeah, recently because of like the Marvel films and stuff that people aren't going to theaters to see movie stars anymore. They're going to theaters to see characters. But the underappreciated aspect of horror that has never been talked about is that very rarely in the horror genre does a movie star have anything to do with the selling of the film. It's the film and its concept itself that makes it great. And I think that's part of the reason my two favorite genres are horror and comedy. I think they're the mo most powerful and the most palpable. And they generally have the most to say. And they're not landing their hopes on big name stars. Their hopes are based on the strength of what they're trying to do. Now, within certain subgenres, there are other selling points. When you look at the slasher genre, right, um, that big selling point has everything to do with the creativity of the kill. And from Freddy Krueger to Jason Voorhees to Michael Myers, even down to Chucky or the Leprechaun, um, and even sillier stuff like uh, the Ginger Dead Man or the Evil Bong. The more creative the kills, the more the fans of that subgenre flock to it. When you look at something else, like the early 2000s had a whole swath of what they called torture porn, which is just extreme violence, essentially. Uh, and I like a lot of those films, quite frankly. The, the hostile films are great examples. Rob Zombie has really um, taken a lot of time and sort of that gritty area when you look at a lot of his films although he did make Lords of Salem which a little bit more European I feel a little bit more uh, metaphoric now don't get me wrong there are fantastic actors and actresses in 
Midsommar. But you don't have any any A-list people. You've got faces you'll recognize from here and there, of course. But, you know, nobody... Nobody is a huge ticket draw, right? It's not what this is about. And if you weren't with us for the screening, if you haven't seen Midsommar, I cannot recommend it enough. I'm just going to say, <laughs> prepare yourself. Um... As beautiful and brilliant as it is, it has very harsh moments. But I think it is an essential. It's one of my favorite films of the past ten years. And it honestly is probably one of my favorite films ever. It just... It has a lot going on and a lot to offer. It's phenomenal. But now on to next week. So... Or next, yeah, literally next week. This episode will come out one week after that. We'll be screening Jaws. That is June 19th at 6 p.m. And the Hotel Gunters speakeasy as always. Jaws is another fantastic film. It, unfortunately, it took me a long time to understand its brilliance. Because I've seen animal, giant animal horror films before and honestly I got a bigger kick out of like Grizzly or something uh, <laughs> but Jaws is phenomenal and it makes sense that it it made a lot of people say. Steven Spielberg is a household name and considered one of the most important filmmakers in the history of cinema and this was a huge stepping stone to getting him on that path there's a lot of great stuff to say about Jaws and there's a reason that it is an essential classic. It is the first blockbuster, um, which I guess is part of what I've held against it for a long time, but we'll, we'll get into that next podcast. But Jaws is really beautiful and amazing, and I cannot wait to screen it and hear the discussions and the thoughts, and I'm hoping we'll get some people that haven't seen it before, although it's kind of hard to escape that film. So anyway, before we go, a couple things. I just, I say this every podcast, but I'm going to probably say it for everyone in the future as well. Uh, a huge thanks to Donnie and Phil Carter and the staff at the Hotel Gunter. Uh, it's been fantastic and, very, and everybody's been very supportive for this. And uh, I cannot express my gratitude for that enough. Also to the Maryland State Arts Council, they've been keeping this thing going and are sort of, the, they are the lifeblood of what this is, and uh, I, I appreciate them as well, and thanks to everybody that comes to these screenings and takes part in these discussions, because it really, it gets me to think about these films in a different way than... I have in the past, <clears throat> you know, sometimes you, we only have one mind, and it's easy to not see the other perspectives or to get lost in your own perspective, and discussions like we had at Midsommar Screening sort of opens, it opened me up, and I, I think sometimes it opens other people up to the perspectives outside of their own mind and I think that's invaluable for this analysis and I also think that it's invaluable in life in general in terms of being able to see and understand how other people feel and think and to get a wider perspective of the world because at the end of the day that's what film and art is right it is the perspectives of others translated through sound and or visual this was a really great ride now i know not everybody enjoyed midsummer <laughs> um <coughs> in fact i had people straight tell me they very much disliked it uh and that's cool it's film society is never about everybody should like everything it's the idea is you watch everything and 
sometimes you'll see something that'll surprise you and blow your mind and sometimes you'll see things you've seen a million times like comfort food and sometimes you'll see something that you hate but it's it's just about the repetition of the experiences and the discussions that sort of make it something a bit larger all right one more time june 19th we're showing jaws at 6 p.m hotel gunter speakeasy thanks everybody have a week you know i think my sister maya is taking a liking to you yeah yep the redhead and actually, she okay. just uh, got the big smidden dig last year. It basically means that uh, you're you are allowed to have sex, pants license. Okay, no! good for her. No, 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 no! Are you poor man? Flip the boat down the pole. Are you poor man? In jail, they don't put down the throne. Hey, what? Stop putting that jail down the coop for stage. What? Okay, relax. Relax. What did I do? What did I do? You pissed on the ancestral tree. The tree? Yes, yes. So what? I didn't know. No, it's that tree is, is tied to all of our dead. It's a dead tree, though. It's dead. Yeah, yeah, I know, but it's important to us. I just had to pee. I didn't know it was special.